Hey everyone, it's Ben here. The Turf Nerds guys, Evan and Greg, have a great episode for you today. This one's a little bit more visual, so you might want to hop onto YouTube and look for the episode there, or watch on Spotify. Uh, Garrett from Magnumatic is with the guys, and he's going to talk about blades. Um, Evan and Greg have done a great job over the last couple months bringing on some really good guests. This is another one. I think you're going to like it. Quick shout out to Tony and to Aaron Sutter. Hope you guys are doing well. Garrett, welcome to the Turf Nerds Podcast, man. Thank you. Greg and I have been excited to um, get you on. Um, <laughs> like to say, Greg and I could attest, Greg, right? Our knowledge of blade sharpening is very dull, and our knowledge of blade balancing is uh, very unbalanced, Greg, right? Uh, yes, I, um, I need to work on my, uh, my skill set a little bit better, to say the least. Yes, and with that being said... Garrett is the vice president of Magnematic Corp. They're based in um, Wisconsin. And uh, Garrett, let's just hop right into it. Give us a little background about yourself. Uh, it's a family-owned business for a long time from what I've seen. Then let's transition into Lawnmower Blades 101 because guys in our industry need to know this. I was uneducated until two years ago when I met uh, you and the team at the Equip Expo. So Garrett, the floor is yours. Very good, thank you. Um, so, uh, as as you had said, Evan, uh, the company is relatively old. My grandfather actually invented the blade balancer in the uh, 1950s, late 1950s, and that, of course, came about because uh, and this is just a quick little history. That's kind of when push mowers and lawn mowing became popular, right? All the returning soldiers from World War. Two and there was the housing boom. So you transferred from the real push mower that we all saw on Leave It to Beaver as far as a, a show reference goes and to rotary mowers. And the problem with the rotary mower is the blade is the flywheel of the engine. And so what was happening is my grandfather was first a Ferguson tractor dealer for implement stuff. And then he got into the lawn and garden stuff as that, as that uh, market got larger. And he was just a country dealer, um, basically out of his home or out of the farm, he recognized uh, through a number of warranty problems that the issue with the motor warranties that Briggs and Stratton and other manufacturers were dealing with on push mowers was due to the blade being out of balance because, again, it's the flywheel of the engine. He was essentially tearing the engines apart. And so he developed a tool to statically balance lawnmower blades, and that is how the company uh, kind of came into being. Um, my father, who immigrated from Germany, um, purchased the company from his father-in-law, uh, my grandfather, and then added all the sharpeners and everything else to it. He was a mechanical engineer, and so he he developed really kind of the whole suite of products. Um, now my brother and I have owned it for uh, oh over 20 years almost now, and um, where I focus on kind of the business sales support and and education of blade maintenance. Uh, my brother is a mechanical engineer, and so he has uh, put a lot of the energy into all the really very neat designs we have today, as well as all the improvements even upon the balancer from the 50s. Um, and so heading into this kind of lawnmower blades 101, you may have seen this uh, on YouTube already. We're going to do a shortened version, so I'll go a little quicker through some of this stuff. Super. Um, to, to start off again, a little bit of history there. My grandpa and grandma at at what was the Equip Expo, but long time ago and under different names and some of the old um, literature there. Again, in the 80s, we started developing sharpeners and got into that. And then here are just a couple pictures of, uh, and some of these are actually a little bit older now because this is from the original uh, PowerPoint that was used. Uh, the sharpeners have all been redesigned. The new models are the 8100 and 8200. And again, this was kind of this we, we always ask this question of how did blade service become so unimportant? And it really happened in how lawnmowers were sold, right? So like 50s up through the 90s, they were always dealerships. And then in the 90s, you have changes where the big box stores start getting bigger and now more people are selling mowers. So you're getting away from the original kind of experienced service tech that you would have in a dealership because people are buying things in other places. And then to landscape businesses grow like crazy in the in the late 90s and all through the 2000s and, and up to today they continue to grow and so 
as the industry has gotten further away, you could say from manufacturer recommendations of how things should be serviced and kind of the technical nature of what it means to be a service tech. Well, the service tech still exists. It's just that there are so many more consumers now that are getting their mowers sometimes from other places. And so therefore there's a disconnect sometimes in education and understanding is, is at least the, 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 or my opinion of it. Um, now to really understand a lawnmower blade, uh, the big misconception is, and we'll get into it, you know, a little quicker here is that it is the tip that cuts. Uh, a lawnmower blade, while it looks like a rectangle, is really a circle. And it's easier to think of it as like a circular saw blade. Okay. It is the tips that cut. But why does a lawnmower blade look like a rectangle then? And it's because we only need two tips because a lawn is not as dense as wood where let's say on a circular saw blade, you would need 60 teeth, 120 teeth, whatever it might be for, for the cut and the type of material you're cutting. So therefore, when we only need two teeth, we don't need to make a full circle. You don't need to waste that much steel. So now a lawnmower blade looks like a rectangle. And the blade looking like a rectangle now gives this misconception to people that it's like a knife or a sword because, well, now the shape is closer to a knife and a sword. And what also happened in the 90s is manufacturers started putting longer and longer cutting edges on. And while even though it's really only the first two inches doing that, let's call it 90, 95% of the work, and you can tell this when you look at a lawnmower blade, you'll always find actual steel lost out at the tip, whereas the rest of the edge or the interior of the cutting edge is a lot of times at best polished. It might be nicked. You might have hit things, but where from cutting grass or steel loss on the blade from actually doing the cutting work is all on the tip. The tip becomes rounded rather than pointed. And that is the definition of a, a dull lawnmower blade. It's not rubbing your thumb against it or across it, I should say, like a kitchen knife. But instead, um, can that tip you know, let's say puncture your thumb. If you're pushing on the tip of the blade, is that, uh, can you feel a puncture type of uh, situation rather than uh, brushing your finger across the edge? So again, it's cutting with this uh, momentum and force of the tip. And again, uh, why is tip speed such an important um, feature, not feature, but um, specification of mowers, right? Because the greater the tip speed, the more acres per hour you can cut, okay? And by having that higher tip speed, that effectively relates right back to that tip cutting. And in this in this slide, we're simply talking about relating it to other cutting tools. Uh, if anybody's familiar with CNC milling machines, um, a shell mill or an end mill is very similar to the way a lawnmower blade works, except instead of the bed moving and the tool being stationary, uh, you know, a lawnmower. Now the whole tool is moving over the stationary material we're cutting, right? Because we can't move the earth. We move the mower over the earth where it's the reverse in a milling machine. So. So quick, quick back thing to that tip speed and why that tip speed has to be so fast is because unlike other cutting methods where you're pushing against the stationary material, like let's say a board being fed into a table saw or even using a scissors or something else like that, we have to have super high tip speed because we're cutting with momentum. That tip has to hit the grass before it knows what hit it, right? because there's no way of holding the grass. You know, we're not putting the grass in a vise and then coming along with a cutting tool to cut it. There is no work holding for the grass. We have to be able to drive over the grass and cut it with such fast momentum that its ability to stand up on its own is the work holding, let's say. And again, here's just some uh, information on just to kind of relate on how fast uh, an 18,000 uh, tip speed or surface speed per minute tip speed mower blade is equivalent to a car's wheel going 200 miles an hour. So we have to then relate that back to how important balance is if you expect to have the machine, the mower itself, running at the performance that the manufacturer promised it would cut at, as well as so that the components last as long as they possibly can. Um, Quick anatomy of a lawnmower blade. We have the tip, we have the edge, 
the lift. And here's the important thing from tip to tip is a cutting diameter because again, I mentioned the blade while it looks like a rectangle, we have to treat it like a disc or a rotor, a, a rotary part uh, per se. So when you measure the, there isn't a length to a lawnmower blade, there's a diameter. And so you measure it diagonally from tip to tip. And that's how you get the, uh, the cutting diameter. Quick things about relief angles. So I'm sure you've all seen drills. You've got a helical relief up a drill, that, that helical spiral in a drill. All cutting tools have reliefs to aid in cutting. Okay. So there are three reliefs in a lawnmower blade because there are three surfaces. We have the surface of the cutting edge. We have the outer end of the blade, like in, in view number two, uh, right here. Uh, we, and, and then of course the, uh, cutting edge as well, which that's actually number two is the cutting edge angle. And, um, so starting with number one, if you look at a mower blade, in this overhead view uh, and up here at one is where the lift would be right and down here is the cutting tip there's always uh, a lot of times a degree or two here because we have to leave room and make sure that we do not run into the grass that has yet to be cut because in this other this other little green circle line if the blade were perfectly square okay this back corner would be brushing or hitting and tearing the grass that this tip had not yet cut okay that's why we have to have that that uh, raked back a little bit so that the tip is sticking out alone and that is the thing that's hitting the grass first the next angle is the the common one everybody kind of pays attention to or notices and that's the cutting edge angle which is typically 30 degrees for finish mowers you'll see some at 35 Usually 40 and 45 are reserved more for brush cutting or rough cutting mowers. And this angle is a lot like that helical uh, space in a drill where the chip leaves, right? When you drill into something, the chip flows up through that helical area. So when the grass gets cut, it flows over that cutting edge up to the lift. And then the lift with the uh, air turbulence it's creating discharges the grass that was cut. So this angle is for chip relief and then the last angle we have is oftentimes in the deck it's the pitch of the deck some blades will actually have this bent into the blade itself but most of the time it's done by deck pitch because again we cannot have the underside of the lift bend or even the whole bottom side of the blade hitting the grass that you've already nicely cut you know, it would be beating up all the nice surface you've just made. So you have to have relief there to let the grass that you've already cut go by. So again, number one, we don't want to hit the grass that, that has yet to be cut. Number two, the grass that has been cut needs to leave. And then number three, let's not wreck the grass that we've already cut. So those three surfaces come together to give you their your pointed tooth and so all of them are important so and of course these are all these wonderful things of turf is greener longer when it's not torn um, you reduce a lot of downtime you get faster forward cutting speeds if your blades are balanced and sharpened you're going to be able to get that full performance specification that the mower manufacturer promised you because you know for sure when they're writing up their brochures and telling you how many acres an hour you can cut with this mower at, at x height they're not doing it with dull unbalanced blades they're doing it with the top performance of the mower when the components are all new, so on and so forth, right? This little flow chart, uh, you know, people can look at a little bit later, but it goes through the process and you can also find it on our website under support and uh, we have an educational blog, but it basically goes through the proper procedures for um, uh, servicing a mower blade, which we'll kind of quickly go through. The first thing is, is inspecting the blade before you'd even clean it. Um, the big place to pay attention is the first picture of the black blade. So again, we talked about the three relief angles. You're going to run out of one of those over time with wear and resharpening. So the one you will run out of is that flat underside. So as we grind away on the cutting edge, 
you will be grinding this edge back until you get to the lift. But we can't grind into the lift bend because otherwise then our cutting edge and tip will be kind of raked or pointing more towards the ground. We need an amount of flat underside to stay relatively horizontal with the earth. Yes, we still have that deck pitch, but we need that flat underside. So that's why the life of a lawnmower blade, you really look at the end view here, like in this picture and go, where's my tip? And then where does the lift bend begin and how much flat surface do I have? That's effectively the life of the mower blade. And in the second picture, you can see this blade is so worn that this small narrow area is all we have left to grind. Because if we go back much further, we're going to be into the lift bend. Um, so that's really the quick determining factor there. Uh, quick little fun fact, obviously, because of the lift, where the lift bend is, affects the life of the blade your high lift blades with where more of the blade is bent up high to give you that greater lift is a sh is a blade with that will have a shorter life because there's less flat underside can also the same way too if you have more of a low lift blade that blade will have a longer life because you're gonna have more material that you can grind over time so kind of a, a little fun way to look at it you know a high lift blade overall will always have a, a shorter life because there's less flat underside um, of course before you uh go any further you always want to inspect for any fractures or real odd wear from sand or other things because you don't want a part of the blade breaking off um, you would discard a blade that has any fractures or things like that um, and two, if a blade is bent, you never want to, you want to never want to try and rebend that. Uh, so then after, after we, if we don't see that there's any obvious bends or cracks or things, the blade should typically be cleaned. Uh, we certainly have a machine for doing this if you have a lot of blades and want it done very cleanly, but even just soaking the blades overnight in, in Dawn dish soap, uh, the stuff will scrape off relatively easily. You do want to get most of the material off so that you, um, can get an accurate balance, you can inspect for fractures, so on and so forth. And do keep in mind too, some landscapers are also paying attention to not transferring diseases from property to property. I've had this be uh, uh, an interest from a number of landscapers that are starting to call in and, and ask about our blade cleaner because they don't want to transfer uh, some disease from one property to another. So that's another reason for cleaning. Uh, back to straightness. The blade balancer, which we've got a side view of the blade balancer here, has a gauge rod on the side to check if a blade is straight. Basically, you put this gauge rod close to the underside of the blade, you rotate it 180 degrees to the other side, and then you see if there's a deviation. And in our manual, we've got a tolerance guide. We've got it here too, but basically the longer the blade, the more it can be off. You never want to try and rebend a mower blade because they are os tempered which is a hardening process that um, increases ductility they're meant to bend once once they bend and you try to bend that material back the material can start to crack and you may not see the cracks um and so you're <coughs> excuse me <coughs> creating a very dangerous situation if you're rebending blades or trying to uh well, might have to cut here and do an edit. <laughs> it's no problem. Excuse me a sec. I got to grab some water. Yep. No problem. How you doing, Greg? I am well. How about yourself? Oh, it's good. It's it. it I find this fascinating. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. I'm just trying to figure out how somebody would try to rebend the blade. I mean, that, that's hardened steel. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've never in my 14 years, guys. That's good that, that Gary's taking a break. This is off the cuff podcast. My 14 years, I've never <laughs> rebent a blade. Once it's bent, it's done. Unless you're that cheap, Greg, right? It's like, holy smokes. No, I can't. I can't imagine uh, trying to do that myself. That would be uh, that would be really something to try and work on. Um uh, Garrett, we were just talking about the yeah. fact, how many people do you know who have tried to straighten a, a blade after it's, you know, that's hardened steel. How, do you see that that often or no? Uh, <clears throat> we get the question a lot. And, uh, you know, yes, I have been around people who have said, oh, yeah, I do it all the time. Huh. So, <clears throat> yeah, it, it is a 
it is a thing. I think it's much more rare than it used to be. Um, but it is something that people do ask about occasionally. The other kind of, you know, and we don't have to include this or we can or whatever, but I've had other crazy calls where people are re-welding the cutting edge back on and then having, you know, adding material so that they can grind it off and make an edge again. Oh, no. I've had some people who had buddies who worked at like heat treaters and they sent their blades into the heat treater, <clears throat> you know, and a buddy did it after hours kind of thing. Overheat treated the blade. And one guy actually told me this story, which, man, I don't know if you want to admit this, but he had his buddy harden him. And then he hit he hit something at a property and the blade shattered and uh, he found like jagged shrapnel in the swing set of the property owner. Oh, wow. So that's, good. <clears throat> that's certainly yeah. safe. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's why, again, because of safety restrictions and regulations and things like that, the mower blade is, is in a relatively narrow window. We can't do much to it to make it last longer <clears throat> because we can't really make it harder because then we deal with a safety thing. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, it just comes down to if you want to get the best life out of the blade, it's maintain it well so that the part can cut as much turf as possible at the highest quality level as possible, rather than just saying it lasts X number of hours. I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but like it's it's having the most quality cutting sharpenings out of the blade rather than, you know, let's say sharpening it twice and throwing it away. <clears throat> so well, let me get the <clears throat> this frog out of my throat. I'm sorry. Getting over a little bit of a cold. That's no problem. I funny to our viewers, Garrett. I've been uh it's funny to do a <clears throat> short tangent here. I had a cold about a month ago, but I abused no spray for a week. And now I've been battling the backup from the no spray. So guys, don't do that. <laughs> it's like bending your blades. Don't do it. Make sure you mention which <clears throat> nose blade you were using. The, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say it by brand, no, but it, uh, it, it's the one you're only supposed to use for three days. <clears throat> I just say it is Afrin. I abused it for about a week. Don't do that, guys. So because I've been sniffing like crazy for like a month now. It's terrible. Yeah, I've just got that tail end of a little bit of a sore throat where I get a little tickle every once in a while. But anyhow, so back to the kind of where where we were at. Um, yes, don't don't bend blades because of the hardening process they've gone through. They are only meant to you know take a hit once, and if if the hit is mild and it's within this tolerance range, you can still you can still use the blade, but don't go and try and bend something back that's been uh, catastrophically bent just for your own safety. The blade's cost is not worth the risk uh, that you're taking. So then now talking about um, normal blade wear, and we, we touched on it a little bit, and this is again kind of an overhead view of a blade where <clears throat> the blue dashed outline here is where the tip was and the natural wear pattern is for it to round because this is where we're actually losing steel because this is where the the actual cutting and wear against the grass is happening um we typically recommend between 8 to 12 mowing hours is where you want to sharpen a blade and the big reason for that is in these two images if you can see them well the first one here where my cursor is shows a very small radius on the tip <clears throat> where the second one is a very large radius now you can kind of look here for us to get back to a square point, how much material we'd have to grind back versus when we've only rounded a small portion of the tip. So this is where I was talking to you get more sharpenings, more sharpenings out of the blade that are actually going to cut the grass rather than, let's say, going for <clears throat> 20 hours. You only cut for the first. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, about oh, you're that. doing okay, Garrett. Just take a take a <clears> little <throat> break there. I was just looking at that, and and one of my uh, one of my questions was going to be, <laughs> and you just answered it, eight to twelve hours, eight to twelve mowing hours, and then and then where eventually you're going to get to the point where here where you're talking about how much we can take off, and that that's those are areas where I'm sure I've tossed out blades thinking I can't do anything else with um and i may potentially have been able to use them for a little bit longer so 
So this is great. I appreciate this. Right. And it really comes back to those those original. <clears throat> if I quick zoom back to to here, it's how much of that flat underside did you have on that blade left? That's that's really that measure. And then really looking at the underside of the blade and going, well, OK, how far back do I have to get to get that pointed corner back? And if I'm not going to run into the lift <clears throat> and my cutting edge will still be relatively horizontal with the ground, we're OK. So. But back to back to this whole thing and, and the reason for the eight to 12 hours and why people may think, oh, that's just crazy. Now, again, that's not machine hours, that's mowing hours. You can use your machine hour um, gauge to give you a rough idea. It might be closer to 15 machine hours because, of course, you're driving around with the blades not always engaged. But the point is, <clears throat> when we sharpen more frequently, you're never going to let that blade get to the point where it's tearing, okay? We always want to be cutting the grass. And as soon as we get that rounded corner, we're going to be tearing. So it's it's back to that, how many quality sharpenings did you get or quality cutting hours out of the blade that you got? Because <clears throat> it's now, if your only aim is to just, you know, knock it down and you don't care about the quality of the cut, of course, that's different. You could make the argument to never sharpen a blade if that's all you wanted. But of course, you're going to put undue load on that mower because it is going to take more energy for that mower to push that blunt corner and still knock something down with momentum. <clears throat> so here was just kind of a funny, funny uh, slide here of a, a gentleman on a five gallon pail with an angle grinder, you know how not to sharpen a mower blade, right? We need to do this in a safe manner, uh, as well as something that's consistent. And angle grinders and all your kind of modified bench grinders and belt sanders, and all these different things that people have kind of made homemade things or even some commercially sold things that are modified, either bench grinders or belt grinders, uh, typically will have problems with uh, safety and inconsistency. Um, you know, again, sharpening... <clears throat> professionally in a way that you can do it consistently. So back to, uh, again, resharpening. This kind of shows again, kind of where the last, where the, the, the red dashed line was, where the rounded corner was, and then like how much material was lost because the blade was left to go so long with such a large radius, right? And this is what, <clears throat> will shorten the life of the blade overall, as well as it uses more of your abrasive, it uses more time to sharpen it. So again, when you get to sharpening in that eight to 12 mowing hour range, um, you know, I can say for, for any of our machines, that's gonna be, you know, sometimes 30 seconds of grinding. It's gonna be very fast sharpening times. But now if you start letting something go 30 hours or more, now you might be standing in front of, you know, uh, our machine or any machine for, you know, quite a few minutes just to hog that material down. And I'm sure everybody has, has experienced that. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Again, here too, the other reason or, or point to using a machine that can give you a consistent cutting edge angle and really making sure you understand whatever machine you pick can actually do that. So here, this example is simply just that each line represents a sharpening. If I have all the lines consistent, I'm going to get more sharpenings than if I'm constantly changing the angle. For example, like freehanding with an angle grinder is is awful because you're constantly changing the angle every time you grind it. So you're overall going to reduce the life of that blade inherently by your process. And um, <clears throat> that's that's the, the big reason for making sure the machine you're using can actually do a consistent cutting edge angle. And um, do be aware, and when you look at a machine, really look at how it adjusts for the angle, what angle it's truly set at, um, <clears throat> because surprisingly enough, some of our competitors don't even list some of that information or even show you or tell you how. Here's another thing about wear pattern and just dealing with what, what a blade looks like over its life. Now, <clears throat> these are both extreme pictures. But generally speaking, a blade cutting edge will be tapered over time. The dashed line was, of course, where the blade was when it was new. And with sharpenings over time and because of the wear at the tip, you're always going to be losing material and grinding material away 
in that first, you know, two inches or so that <clears throat> you want to blend the rest of the cutting edge in as kind of a big tapered look. This retains strength and we're trying to leave as much steel on this blade as we can for safety. When people think that the cutting edge has to be parallel with the original shape of the blade, they will grind in the manner that we have listed as bad here. And, you know, if you've seen like skag blades or other blades where there are high lifts and there will be a notch cut out behind the lift, this fracture point gets even scarier where the whole end of the blade can break off. But there is no advantage. This blade, if we grind as shown, the cutting edge parallel to the original rectangular shape of the blade, pushing that back, this blade will not cut any different than this blade. They both have a pointed tip and they will both, you know, cut the grass. So removing all this additional material provides you with no tangible benefit. So uh, let's see. Here. I, I'm sorry, Gary. Don't, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Um, yeah, go for it. it Guys, if you're listening to the show, I would highly encourage you to to watch the video on this because this is a great shot that he has here. And I know we get a lot of guys are listening to us on the podcast, but just as um, and and Garrett already pointed it out, but you you really need to see the picture of what he's showing here. So if you have an opportunity, uh, Evan, do you know how much time we are into the uh, video at this point into the uh, podcast? Can We're roughly get... 34 minutes, so we got, um, yeah, we got plenty of time. But uh, for okay. our pre-intro, we'll record a pre-intro of saying to watch this on YouTube. It'll be available on all platforms, but uh, this is definitely going up on uh, YouTube. It's a great illustration about wear pattern, though. This okay. is excellent. All right, great. And that, so we're about 30 minutes into the podcast, guys. If you want to, after you've already listened to us once, <laughs> uh, then go back and, oh, boy. And, <laughs> and, uh, and and look at the uh, what Garrett's showing you here. And at this point, you can see where I, I think this is really important for guys about 30 minutes in or so that, that where you'll be able to see this picture. Yep. And just a real quick, it's a, it's an overhead view of two blades. And basically, um, you know, one has a very tapered look where the cutting edge was and the other one, the edge was ground back square to the original shape of the blade. So, but the, again, the picture will show you more. Um, <clears throat> so quickly now getting into balance because in the grand scheme of the um, flow chart that we were talking about, it went uh, from, you know, inspection, cleaning, checking the straightness, and then once we've done all those things, then we can sharpen the blade. It's getting both tips nice and sharp. Now we move on to balancing. Some people think balancing should be done before, but you're kind of chasing your tail if you put balancing before sharpening, because with sharpening, there is a certain amount of material we have to remove from the tips to get our tips back, and it is not going to be even from each side. And this is an important note about balance. The idea of counting how many passes you make on one side versus another is a totally unreliable and unrepeatable way of saying I balanced my blade because when I sharpened it, I did 10 passes on one side, I did 10 passes on the other. That's how I know it's balanced. <clears throat> That does not work because keep in mind, the mower blade did not wear evenly because the lawn is not evenly, the, the density of the grass is not evenly distributed of where you're cutting. So therefore the wear is not even that is happening as well as, you know, not to even talk about like little nicks and things like that from, from uh, not even hitting something massive, but just soil and sticks and other things are creating other nicks. And so the wear and mass distribution has completely become uneven from use. And this is the unique thing about a lawnmower blade and why lawnmower blade balancing is important. And you don't hear about, well, I don't have to balance my car tires every so many hours. <clears throat> and it is because now they're balanced once when you get new tires, your wheels are balanced. Everybody's pretty used to that. If you've ever bought a pulley for a mower or let's say, um, impeller or a flywheel or anything else like that. You'll see little drill marks around the outside at some place where somebody balanced that unit. They made little drill divots to remove material to get that part in balance. And new mower blades are balanced uh, as well. <clears throat> some manufacturers do it better than others, so on and so forth. But what is unique about the mower blade versus the pulley or your car tire is that the mower blade is cutting this uneven material with varying density. 
and because there are all these different things you could hit or run into or change the wear of that blade, whereas a pulley can run its whole life and it's never going to wear unevenly. It's only, let's say, a belt that's running on it that's rubbing you know, on it a little bit, but that's always going to be even. Same thing, too, with a car tire. Unless you would have a catastrophic braking um, situation where you would put a flat on a portion of the tire, normally a tire is always wearing relatively evenly because the road surface is quite consistent. The tire material is quite consistent. <clears throat> So you don't have this need for constant balancing. This makes a lawnmower blade super unique uh, because that balance is changing all the time. And so we need to keep up on it at the point of the time it requires sharpening to maintain uh, some type of balance throughout the whole life of the part. So <clears throat> normally, um, it, it also must be said that We'll, we'll touch a little bit on like the little tabletop cones and a nail in a wall do not function because they are not measuring from the center of rotation. Any rotary part, when you're balancing it, you have to balance from the center point of its rotation. OK, so we've got this crosshair here with an arrow pointing. This is the center rotation. If I hang this on a nail of the wall, it's hanging from the top of the hole, not from the center. OK. Um, this is just a symbol for the center of mass. And now what we're showing in this in this diagram is horizontal unbalance and where the center of mass uh, locator is, is showing simply that the center of mass, we want it to be in the center of rotation. That would be perfect, a perfect balance situation. But because of also the the mass distribution of the the steel, as well as uneven wear, the weight of the blade or the out of balance position or the center of mass can move. And so here we're having it in a horizontal uh, situation. So, for example, if this blade were on the balancer, the side with the center of mass um, icon or the right side of the blade would want to swing down to six o'clock. Um, here is where, you know, when when something is in balance, like I was saying before, now the center of mass and center of rotation are in the same place. That's that's what we aim for. That's a very difficult thing to achieve, but that's what you aim for in trying to correct balance. Um, again, <clears throat> here we're talking again about the <clears throat> excuse me nail on the wall and the tabletop cones that you can get at little hardware stores. They are not in the center of rotation, so they are an unreliable and unrepeatable um, measure of balance. You can put a nail on the wall, and if you push on it a little bit left or right, you can make it read whatever you want it to. And again, you're not from the center of rotation, um, so this is not uh, any type of accurate way of balancing. And we have a whole video with the calculations on even understanding greater of how that works, as well as we do demonstrations with it. The tabletop cone has a problem because the little steps in the cone that are required to keep the blade or try to keep the blade level when you're trying to measure this are never the same size as the hole diameter. So what happens is you have the ability to shift it on any one of those steps. And if you are not perfectly always on the same place in the step, you can shift the center of rotation in different places on those steps, therefore taking it on and off this it's very difficult to ever get the same reading twice in a row because of the inconsistency of its locating the center point. So that's why these these functions, do, these types of tools do not work. <clears throat> uh, the, the MAG 1000 balancer is really the only tool that functions. And um, just a side note, do be aware um, in the last six months, we have seen an extreme amount of counterfeits of our products where they're even making it look like it. They're using our picture and selling them for, you know, far less than we are, but they're all um, foreign counterfeit product being sold heavily on Amazon and eBay. So be aware of that. We've bought some and tested them. They're, they're truly awful. They are, they're made to look like our product, but they do not function. So just be real careful with that kind of stuff. Now you may ask, well, Hey, you just said there's no other way to balance a blade than with your product. No, there is there there are some other ways. There are dynamic balancers, which are very expensive pieces of equipment, um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And then there are parallel bars. Uh, you can always Google parallel bars, but for that you need an arbor that you can mount the blade on. And then there essentially are two sets of um, 
arms that are mounted onto a table with roller bearings. And then you set this arbor in with the blade and basically it can rotate just like our balancer. However, there's a whole setup of locating the center with a specialized arbor for each blade hole size that you would have. Um, this is the static way that a lot of boat props are done with, with, um, par between parallel bars, it's referred to. Anyway. <clears throat> This goes in a little bit to, again, of the whole balance situation of where the center of mass is and which way the blade is going to rotate because of Earth's gravity is going to pull um, the center of mass downward. So our indication is that the one side of the blade will rotate to six o'clock. And it is in that quarter turn that we get all of our information. When the blade, it, it is all about how fast the blade moves from, let's say, in this example, from three o'clock to six o'clock. If that blade drops in less than four seconds, that is a lot of weight out of balance. You definitely want to grind that off and correct that. If the blade takes six seconds or longer, let's say it takes eight seconds to, to get down to six o'clock, and maybe let's say it even stops at five, that blade has fractions of a gram out of balance because of the sensitivity of our balancer, the reason we make it so sensitive and so accurate so that you get a very fast reading. So in that quarter turn, within a couple seconds, you see how that blade moves. You've got all the information you need. And with a little bit of experience, you'll go, okay, for my blades, it moved that quick. That's X amount of passes for me or something like that. And then a quick recheck on the balancer to see if you, you know, pushed at an even rate. There you go. This again is just talking about this is all in our manual. You can always look at this later, but basically that same thing. It's it's the acceleration of the blade that we're trying to pay attention to. Some people think you have to place the blade on the balancer, walk away, have a coffee and come back in a half an hour and see where it stopped. The stopping point. Um, excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Some kind of update on something anyway. Um, <clears throat> So scratch that. The it is it is the acceleration that we want to pay attention to because that gives us our information. Where the blade settles doesn't um, give us any real tangible information that we can use to correct it. Um, horizontal unbalance and and we'll go a little quicker over some of this. We'll, we go into more detail in the longer um, webinar that you can find online. But generally, horizontal unbalance is what we're dealing with with more blades. Because, of course, it's the two tips that are wearing, and because we, they're so far from the center, you have something called a moment arm. It's almost like a lever. So the more weight further out near the tip, the greater the impact that's going to have on the balance, Okay, as well as when you remove material, it has more of an effect closer to the tip. And because it's the tips that wear, usually horizontal unbalance is what we're always correcting in mower blades. Um, and then lastly, I mean, there's there's packaging if you're doing this service for somebody else. And and that would be the end of the of the uh, service process. So, again, just talking again about that condition of the mower blade is is the more important quality component that you have control over than necessarily which mower you have. Most mowers are relatively similar, and I know I'm making a big general statement there, but it is how you maintain that piece of equipment that is going to most directly relate to your end quality product of how that lawn looks and the quality of the cut of that lawn rather than what brand is on the mower, okay? So no matter what your equipment is, without good maintenance, it will never live up to the promises of that manufacturer's original specifications. So the blade being the thing that most directly touches that cut lawn, you can make such an impact by something so simple as blade maintenance to your end product. And uh, we, we touched on a little bit, but again, when you cut a lawn rather than tear it, it will stay greener longer. It will be healthier. It will require less fertilizer. It won't turn yellow as soon as other lawns that have been torn when there's a dry spell that comes around. So effectively, you can make your customers' lawns look better by simply balancing and sharpening your blades properly. And uh, one other little thing we didn't touch on, too, is... Um, Again, the load that that puts on a mower, uh, you can achieve 
close to 25% fuel efficiency with balancing and sharpening a blade because you're letting that engine put all its full horsepower into rotating th something that's going to, first of all, cut through the grass with less effort, as well as you're giving it something that is balanced, that it doesn't have to use extra work to drive a vibratory load because of an out of balance condition. And, and I've had many landscapers who didn't believe that they tried it. And, you know, sure enough, they said, Hey, I use a quarter tank less on a property. I always use the tank of fuel, um, going from, you know, no balancing and sharpening and just let's, let's say an angle grinder or something. Um, but essentially that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Uh, we have a lot of educational information at our YouTube channel, as well as, uh, on the educational support section of our website. And I'll just let you hit me with any questions. Garrett, thank you for this uh, presentation. It's eye-opening. We we'll kind of do a sh little smorgasbord of questions here, but kind of, I, I guess, two questions into one or more, more of a statement. Guys, Garrett is right. Sharpening your blades every 8 to 12 hours will actually prolong the blade life because, I mean, I've done it. I waited one time like 30 hours, 40 hours to sharpen my blades. And I spent like 20 minutes just trying to get a incorrect proper, proper angle on it. But when I sharpened every eight to 12 hours, it was much easier because I took off much less material, even though it seems like I'm taking off more material, I guess, by sharpening frequently. I'm only doing a couple passes. But uh, with that um, with, with that being said, um, how sharp should a blade be? I, in my opinion, I think you've touched on this, but I don't remember uh, when you said this in previous uh, seminars that I've listened to. Um, do you want the blade like basically like butter knife sharp? Because you don't want it razor sharp because then you'll easily get nicks and um, the, the blade, if it's too sharp, especially guys, we're talking about like the corner of the blade, that, that tip of the blade that um, Garrett's been really harping on here. If you have it too sharp, anything you hit is just going to chip and, you, and uh, we can't ruin that corner because if you ruin that corner, you're going to get bad bad cut quality and weird streaks and weird stripes. Yep. And so that, that reminds me of something else too. Um, back to the whole thing of when you let a blade go to like that, geez, you know, even, even sometimes at like 25 hours already, and you let that radius get so large on the tip. Um, let's see if we can find back to like, you know, here, if you let this radius get so big, Remember we talked about that the blade has a diameter, not a length, and it's measured from tip to tip. When you have a huge rounded corner, a giant radius from wear on a blade, the blade is now effectively shorter. So if you find that you're mowing, and one of the problems you have with mowing is you're double cutting. Now, double cutting can happen for a couple reasons. You might be mowing too fast, let's say the grass is too high and you're you're feeding too fast you know your feed rate is too high you're driving too quickly or it can be that the blades are so worn that now you're getting grass left between the blades in a multi-blade deck you're getting like stringers or just blades of grass that didn't get cut well even though the blades are timed and, and things like that and there is some overlap in, in the timing of most mowers if that radius is so big, your blade is effectively shorter and it's going to be missing stuff. So do keep in mind, maintaining that tip also has has uh, has something to do with that. Now, back to your question of how sharp is too sharp or where do I stop and how far do we want to go? Now, <clears throat> I leave this a little bit open. Now, a new mower blade will cut effectively and they are, you know, what some people would say, a kind of butter knife sharp, right? They're not something you're going to slice a tomato with. Um, but of course, again, it's all about that pointed corner, that tip. I have had some landscapers who have done real nice kind of scientific testing where they've, they've, uh, with the same mower tried real razor sharp blades and some, you know, left it a, a little bit more blunted or subdued, let's say. And they found that sometimes the real razor uh, razor edge uh, does provide some benefit. A lot of times that has been more with some of the commercial um, blades where they actually have mulching blades. And when I say mulching, I mean blades that are actually wavy, curvy cutting edges um, where some of the interior of the edge may do a little bit of recutting depending on if the baffle system within the deck and the lift and the design of the blade are all working together, okay? Some mowers and some mower manufacturers have gotten that, you know, let's say that um, 
that recipe to work. And there are other mowers where no matter what, because of either how they've laid out the baffles in the deck uh, or whatever, it's still really only that first two inches that's doing all the cutting. Um, and like I said, it, that razor stuff, razor sharp stuff, I, I think is only really going to benefit some of those real specific um, mulching situations. Um, so the most part, I would stay away a little bit from the super fine razor edge because the finer the edge, the more damage it will take, like like Evan was saying. Um, and also, it becomes a safety hazard. It, you're ha you have to handle these blades to put them on and off the machine, and we're always in a hurry, right? So if you have this a super razor edge, and you know even if you're careful with good gloves, um, they can be super sharp, and and it's it's easy to cut yourself. So what I always recommend is. If you've had to sharpen the blade, let's say because of damage or repair or anything else like that, or, or the tip was just so bad that you make the edge a super, super fine razor edge, just to lightly take a file and not necessarily perpendicular to the edge, but kind of uh, at a little bit of an angle from the bottom and just lightly take that burr off so it's not as crazy sharp. Um, one other little thing I'll touch on, some people like the idea of something that was popular for a while called killing the edge where people would make a razor edge and then take a file and let's say square the edge. So they take a file and go perpendicular to the edge, run down it and kind of put this blunt bluntness on it. Um, you can certainly do that. Uh, I don't think you're going to get a, a giant advantage one way or another. Um, will it make that leading edge a little stronger? Yes. Um, but you're also then sacrificing some of your tip, depending on how far you went, right? And we're, we're kind of just talking about this now, but it depends on how far someone would go with that file. Uh, I would say use the file for light deburring, largely for handling safety. That's perfect. Hey, Greg, do you, uh, I, th I think you had some question, uh, questions, Greg, uh, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I did have a, a couple of questions for you here. You've actually touched on quite a bit of the. <laughs> I wrote down about uh, eight or ten questions, and I think you've covered most of them. Uh, going back to cleaning your blade prior to even uh, sharpening it, you mentioned uh, soak it in Dawn dish soap and uh, and uh, in a bucket of water. Yep. Um, so, <clears throat> so that that. There are a lot of ways you can clean a blade. Some people use pressure washers. Um, we, of course, like I said, we make a machine for it that will do it very quickly without making a big mess. Some people use open wire wheels on bench grinders. I tend to tell people to shy away from that. It makes a huge mess and you're standing in the path of the brush and those wire brushes always let loose bristles. And then you're just, you've got to wear a heavy, you know, leather apron and face shields and everything else. And, and as well as like, it just gets green garbage all over your shop. Um, really, I think what the easiest least effort way of doing it without buying our machine is either taking a five gallon pail or let's say kind of like a smaller animal stock tank, fill it with water with Dawn dish soap and let the blade soak overnight night <clears throat> and then overnight in the next morning or next whenever you get to them again you can use a paint scraper a big putty scraper and most everything will come off relatively easy if you have that time to wait and set them um <clears throat> in the water to soak now you will have kind of dirty water to deal with but that's i think easier than you know like I said, pressure washing. I think when when people try to pressure wash them in their driveway, all they do is shoot their blades down the driveway. But you know, some people like it, so that's it's. I've done that. <laughs> a, a lot of different ways you can do it, but. Well, and if you have a cat, they have fun chasing after it as well. Um, but you know, it's um, that's really important. And I was going to ask you about the wire wheel. If after you soak it, do you wire wheel it? But you just answer that as well. Um, but it's I, I kind of find it interesting that when we were talking about going eight to twelve hours on a on a runtime on actual mow time, um, that it's it's almost I I think of it as almost like flossing flossing your teeth if you do it enough because everybody always says ah, I'm not it's not good doing point. me any good to floss my teeth, <laughs> but um, when you go into the dentist that's when you find out the advantages of flossing your teeth because you spend less time. And now you just said you're spending less time when you're doing it more often. You're spending less time uh, uh, sharpening as opposed to waiting it out too long. 
Yep. And, and the, the analogy works, you know, for, for the blade, you know, just as well, because not only are by flossing and, and care, you're extending the life of your teeth, um, by regular care and maintenance, you're also extending the life of the blade as well as again, like with the teeth, you're going to have a higher quality life without pain while you're eating. If we That's take care of the breath teeth, too. <laughs> right. You know, and all exactly all of that too. Whereas again, too, now if we have a blade that we're maintaining regularly uh, and more frequently, we're getting that higher quality cut on all the lawns we do instead of only the first 10 hours of lawns we do. Because, you know, if you have somebody who, let's say, sharpens once a week and they're doing, even if they're not doing 10 hour days, you know, whatever, let's say they're doing, you know, five hour days, their first two days, everybody's lawn looked nice. And then the rest of the week, everybody else got a torn up, you know, rough cut lawn. So it's one of those things where, and, and, Here's another thing that jogs my memory too. a big suggestion for people if they're looking at this and going like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to take these blades off every morning and I'm going to lose all this time in the morning. While I understand what I'm suggesting is an investment, try to have a set of blades that will last you or an, have enough sets of blades that will last you a week. So if you're cutting 10 hours a day, well, then have a set of blades a day. If you kind of do that 10 hours every other day, because again, you're using multiple mowers, each mower is not doing a full 10 hours a day. It might be kind of every two or three days. Have two sets of blades for the week then, if that's your situation. And then do all your sharpening on a rain day or at the end of the week and productionize that work. Have all those blades ready on the shelf and, you know, like a NASCAR pit crew, just change the blades out and make hay while the sun is shining and get on the lawn and do the work. Not this kind of, we're going to do service before we leave, or we're going to try and do service at the end of the day when we're tired. Well, that's, that's a good one. Uh, Garrett quickly on that. Uh, say your blades are sharp. We have your balancer. Now, now I have your balancer and, and your sharpener because it's backed by logic and science stuff here. What do you, how, how do you explain mowers even with sharpened blades and balanced blades leaving stragglers a it's probably a faster going b the conditions if you're cutting the discharge rate of the mower of discharging all that grass out there could leave some stragglers but i think stragglers could also be left because of the blade tip being a little rounded correct certainly it's it's it can be all those things uh, i would say a lot of times probably the the two most common culprits are going to be uh people driving too fast for the height they're trying to cut you know, that's already the first thing, you know, people are going to be in a hurry and they're like, you know, that's the other kind of like soapbox thing. They've made mowers drive so fast that they they drive faster than what the blades can accept. And again, depending on what the cut height is, right, there are still variables, uh, even in that statement that I made. So depending on the height of the mo height of the grass you're trying to cut and how nice you're trying to get it to be cut. And then how you're maintaining the blades are all going to factor into, you know, whether or not you're having to double cut or go back and, and hit stragglers and things like that. Um, but a lot of times I think it's too fast and, and blade maintenance. Greg, did you have something? I have one more, but Greg, go ahead. The um, gas savings is something that you had mentioned earlier, and I was looking at that. You said it. It was somebody else that found 25% savings, or was it you guys that had done a, uh, done some work and found about 25% savings in fuel costs? I've had a number of landscapers report that to us um, because uh, there had been, um, I would have to go dig it up, but there was a study that I think the University of Purdue did once about um, having sharp blades and how much fuel that saved. And uh, there was something along those lines. Again, that's a, a little bit older, older situation. And we had we had done some, uh, you could say, analytic testing on load and then, you know, fuel efficiency on a load, knowing that that's going to save fuel. But I've I've always told customers about that, that if you're taking load off of the mower, you're going to burn less fuel. You know, it's just like if. You're pulling a trailer with a truck versus not pulling the trailer, right? You know, you're you're adding more load to that engine and therefore it's going to burn more fuel. If you or for example, let's say you have 
one guy on a mower who's only 150 pounds and then the other guy driving the mower is 300 pounds that mower is going to burn more fuel driving the additional load and when something is dull it is going to take more effort and put load on the on whatever's driving it to get through that same to, to cut that same material as well as the same thing too when something is out of balance it creates a vibratory load and that vibration has to be taken up by something you know the you have to have additional power to to do that just think about if you have to hold on to something that's vibrating versus holding on to something that's not moving right you're you're now having to put muscle force into try and stabilize this thing that might be vibrating that you're trying to carry or hold on to which is going to burn calories so on and so forth right it's 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 just energy in energy out kind of deal so just going uh Going on with that, then your spindles, we, we kind of touched on it briefly, but your spindles, uh, you you had mentioned that you guys have guys that, uh, well, it doesn't uh, bother. I've never replaced a spindle in 30 years of mowing. and But yep. have you looked at that and seen, hey, how much how much is that wearing on the spindle? Is there any kind of percentage that you're seeing when that's off as well? Um, so... <clears throat> With that, we've gotten some information from more manufacturers who, of course, use our balancer in their quality control department. And and yes, there 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 there's direct correlation to how much vibratory load will wear a bearing out. And that that goes for everything, not just blades. Um, that goes for you know a camshaft, that goes for a wheel, that goes for a pulley, that goes for everything. I mean, the wheel bearings in your car, bearings are are taking a hammering from vibratory load. Um, but uh, kind of more directly to your question, over time, we've seen mower manufacturers use larger and larger bearing spindles, and it is my uh, opinion or assumption that that is largely being done to get mowers through a certain general life, whether it be the warranty period or whether it might be through uh, a normal number of hours before they would then suggest uh, a normal maintenance. But I would then make the statement that if someone were always balancing and sharpening their blades properly, they should never have to replace a bearing spindle. Uh, those bearings in there should la last easily the full life of the mower. And it is oftentimes the people that say, I've, I've never replaced the bearing spindle. One, they're either just luckily getting manufacturers that are super oversizing the bearing spindles to just deal with that. Um, lack of maintenance, uh, or oftentimes those are people who are lease leasing mowers for only a season or two, and they're never dealing with that extended maintenance kind of situation. Of course, in this industry, we've got a lot of different um, philosophies on how to deal with the cost of, of equipment, right? Some people like to lease things, some people like to own it and essentially use it up its full life and repair it and you know drive it into the ground kind of situation. So it really depends the mower, the mower manufacturer, and how you're using it. But no matter what, you're still going to gain a faster forward cutting speed, and you're going to gain fuel efficiency, even if you're not concerned about lengthening the life of the equipment. But yes, balancing is also preventative maintenance. Right. Great. Thank you. That it, It's funny. Greg basically asked my, uh, asked my question Garrett, it's been real. Thank you for coming on our show. Um, do me a favor. Push your social medias. Um, what's your kind of special big ask right now for this uh, upcoming season? We'll see you at the Equip Expo in 2024. But where can we find you on social media? And what what last wisdom nugget can you leave these guys? Because you've corrected my false ways. I sharpen way more frequently now every 8 to 12 hours. Balancing is important, even though, as Garrett said, they're overpowering or they're 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 overbuilding the spindles so they last. What's kind of your uh, last pull thing here as we um, park the mower into the trailer? Uh, really, again, just realizing that the blade is the most critical or tangible component that you have control over to result in the best quality cut that you can give your customer. Because when it's all said and done as a, as a lawn care professional or landscaper, um, you are looking and selling the service of a beautiful lawn. And if something as 
inexpensive and easy as maintaining the blade, arguably probably one of the least cost parts on the whole mower. If you just put a little effort into that, you can gain so much on the quality of the product you provide or that service, which is your, of course, your product that you're providing to your customer. And it's, it's such a simple way of adding value uh, to your business and to your customer base. And that's, that's probably where I'd, I'd hit it. So the blades are more important than everybody likes to think, uh, you know, again, they're not, they're not exciting. They're not, um, it's, it's not a sexy part of the, of, of the whole job, but if, if you, uh, pay attention to it, you can reap, reap some rewards. Perfect. And, uh, where can people find you uh, online? Uh, of course you can go to magnematic.com. Uh, and check out all our equipment there. Uh, under the support section, we have uh, a lot of educational information. We have a whole educational blog with a lot of articles with a lot of the same information from the webinar broken up into into other things as well as other additional things. Um, on YouTube, it's uh, Magnematic Corp. Um, and Instagram, also Magnematic. And we're also on Facebook too, is Magnematic. Um, so check us all out there. We're doing more and more on YouTube. We just started a tip of the day series where we're going to be tip, we're going to be doing little tips of like, you know, whether it be information about this blade or a specific blade to different ways you can use our equipment or other little, little ways you can get more out of things. Um, that's a new section we're doing, but also even feel free to call because we're a family company, uh, on our third generation, we take a lot of pride in the equipment. Um, we, we think there's a lot of value in educating the uh, customer base so that they can understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, give us a call. I'll be happy to talk to you. If you've got your own questions, uh, give us a call. It's 800-328-1110. I'll be happy to talk to you about any of these subjects in more detail or in specific relation to your into your business because that's what we're ultimately here for. We're, we're, a, we're a machine builder, but we're, we're here to... Um, provide that support to our customers. And that's the big thing that's different about us than uh, any of the catalog companies that you might buy from. And and, and again, to uh, most of what we compete with is, is foreign stuff. So if you're looking for a piece of equipment that you're going to get a, a full two-year warranty and lifetime phone support, and you could call a human and actually get talk to the people who actually build it. Um, that's a concept. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what we offer. Uh, we do not use a push one, two, or three, when you call Magnematic, a human always answers. And if the lines are all busy, yes, we do a voicemail. That's about the only time, <laughs> that's the only time it's it's not. Um, but uh, give a call. We're happy to talk about anything. Greg, you got anything to uh, close, Greg? No, I, I just really want to thank you. This has uh, really been eye-opening for me uh, to be able to take a look at this. And you know, I'm one of those guys that doesn't sharpen enough. So this is uh, really important that I have this opportunity. And, you know, that one that I was saying about 30 minutes in, just to be, to be able to take that angle because I thought I'd had to get rid of to my blades. Now I learned uh, learned a new angle that I can and uh, sharpen at and still be able to get some extension out of my blades. So I appreciate it. Guys, uh, listen to this. This is great. And then you guys are going to be at the uh, show in Louisville? Yes, we we, uh, we go to that show every year and have since, oh, I think 92 or something like that. So that's where you can really kind of get your hands on the equipment. Uh, one kind of little fun thing, uh, because of the safe nature of our equipment, the way we enclose the machines to control sparks, dust, and um, and also how quiet our machines are, we're the only lawnmower sharpening uh, manufacturer, sharpener manufacturer that is allowed to demonstrate indoors at Equip Expo. All of our competitors have to uh, demonstrate outdoors because their machines are so loud and noisy. So it's something where you can actually come and try the machines at, Equi at Equip Expo and talk to us and uh, and uh, really kind of pick our brains. And last little plug I'll, I'll give uh, with our, our latest system, the 8200 platform, one new thing, uh, of course, in this industry and in most industries, products are based on a product line. And a lot of times you're, you're, you're moved up through a product line, right? You buy something, you start out here, you need something and you expand, right? We built our new 8200 platform, almost like the idea of the way car companies make car chassis, and then you can have other models off of it. So we have one platform that someone could 
buy the base model and over time change it into water cooled. They could add it, add a belt grinder option to it. They could add mulching blade support to it. They could add angle changing to it, or you could buy that already all set up that way. So we're making a machine now that instead of having to, as you grow, buy a bigger and bigger machine for more volume, we're selling a machine that can actually grow with your business rather than um, constantly force you into buying new equipment. So that's kind of a real new concept for the industry as far as um, having this upgrade ability and also an upgrade ability that you can do yourself. All of these add-ons are, are bolt-on features that you can do yourself. And that's great. You're thinking about the... Uh... The the little mechanics within all of us in the uh, lawn industry. Everybody wants to be able to go bigger and better, uh, and and or b greater and and greatest. But you're now giving us the ability to be able to do that with familiarity. We don't have to learn an entirely new system. It sounds like as well. That's that's absolutely another benefit of that too, because the machine is going. It's the same machine. You're going to have the same benefit of using it in the in the exact same manner, but you can have these performance upgrades, or let's say also just ability upgrades. Like if you didn't have curvy wavy mulching blades, you were only straight blades, and then you got a mower that happened to have that. You can simply buy an add-on and then be able to do those blades too. And you're not being forced into buying like another model and another model and another model, which again, most companies like to like to do that. And we just thought it'd be way nicer to allow the lawn care professional to, which many times they start part-time, right? And and then the business grows and grows and grows and they grow into something very large. And if you had a machine that would grow with you, wouldn't that kind of be nice? And that's the model, guys. That's the model that uh, I actually bought from Garrett last week. And the thing is absolutely awesome. It's like it's it's seventy two pounds. I was talking to Greg. I'm like, Greg, this thing is super heavy, but it you know gets the job done. So Garrett, thank you again. I'm so happy I didn't call you Gerd at all during this episode. I was <laughs> that's okay. I, I kept hammering Greg. I'm like, hey, hey, Greg, it's Gerd, Gerd. It's uh, sorry. Garrett, 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 not Gerd, because I call him Gerd a thousand times on the phone, and I felt, <laughs> I felt terrible. But Garrett, thank you. I'm going to be sending you something in the mail as a token of my appreciation shortly. Guys, check them out. Um, Magnematic Corp. Google them. They're on um, YouTube. And uh, Garrett, we hope to see you here at the uh, Equip Expo in 2024. That's all I got. Excellent. Thanks, Look guys. forward to it. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks again, Thanks. Garrett. And uh, like and follow us, guys. We appreciate it.